So, theme. Um, of course, whenever I say theme, I think of Christmas story. Remember he has to write that Christmas theme about trying to get the Red Rider baby oh, yeah. gun? Um, that's not the question. But the, uh, you know, I know that a lot of writers don't think about theme. Um, mm -hmm. And that a lot of times they'll go back when they're done or they'll kind of see as they're writing a novel that there's, there seems to be some underpinning that was maybe unplanned. Um, I'm wondering with you, is it something you think about consciously? Is it something that, or not, and then do you go back and say, yeah, it kind of feels like there are some through lines here? Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty conscious on my part, I'd say. In the Terra Downs books, there is one overarching theme, and I wanted to explore this idea of a deity whose sole divine attribute is love, and how that might affect change in the world through those who follow his faith. Yeah. And so the precept, love as thou wilt, is echoed over and over throughout all the Terdange books. And that idea of love affecting change in the world is a theme that gets revisited in a multitude of variations. Yeah. You know, I, for me, I know that I go back and I will see theme, but I, um, I haven't done a good job yet of having something in mind before I start. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, now I have to ask you about writing quirks. Most writers have them. Um, one writer that I, that I interviewed has this uncanny ability to um, sort of forecast the number of words in his novels. And like, like scarily, like savant real. Hmm. Um, uh, another writer, Terry, uh, Terry Brooks, he, he kind of has a place. He must sit in that place. It must be ordered and, and neat. Um, and that's the place he writes. And on and on. I'm wondering, are there any sort of these kinds of rituals or, or quirks you have? Nothing really fun. I used to be able to, I will say this is one thing that's changed. When writing was the most precious thing in the world and I was, you know, scrambling to make time for it with a day job and um, I, I could write, could, would, and did write anywhere. Yeah. And now that I've been doing it full time, I'm spoiled and yeah, I need my office, I need my things. Yeah. Okay. But I don't really have any rituals. Yeah, for me it's five-hour energy drink, uh, and the reason is because I'm um, I'm in that like you described. I'm doing a day job, so I have to get up early, mm -hmm. and so I kind of shock my system into awakeness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's your little writing Eucharist. <laughs> yeah, I figure sponsorship at some point with <laughs> with five-hour energy, energy guys. Work for Chelsea Handler and vodka. Really? I didn't know that. It's real. I can get a sponsorship. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this next question is a, is a topic that also really interests me. I actually wrote a short story once on this. Um, it's, a, it's an idea that was expressed in, I think, a scientific journal called Semantic Contagion, and it's the notion that the expression of certain ideas maybe should be suppressed because um, as these ideas sort of get out there, people embrace them and maybe they're not the best ideas. And an example, um, there's a, a condition I'm going to read here, uh, apotendophilia. Um, I want to be sure I pronounce that right. That is absolutely a new one on me. Yeah, it's the it's the desire to have a healthy limb amputated, and there's there's studies that show that as this idea has become expressed, the behavior around that has has increased. So um, I'm leading kind of into the notion of censorship, um, and by that I mean, do you self censor? Are there things that you decide I'm not writing about that uh, because it's not my worldview or um, I don't want to perpetuate that notion. I know Stephen King pulled a short story called King Rose Up about a high school student who ascended a tower with a high power rifle. Because mm -hmm. um, after Columbine, he wasn't sure he wanted to introduce that idea. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. Um, I think if I ever did do that, I probably stopped before writing Kushiel's Dart because that was such an outrageous idea, basically, to have a novel whose protagonist is a divinely ordained masochistic courtesan. Yeah. Uh, there's no way you could self-censor and do justice to that. Yeah. And I had to think really long and hard about, is this idea worth doing? Why is it worth doing? I started thinking you could really subvert all those tropes of female victimization and turn the whole thing inside out. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think I put that aside. Yeah, put that aside and really, and that was when I also had a huge creative breakthrough in the caliber of my writing when I took a big risk. 
Oh, uh, that actually makes a lot of sense. So I may have been guilty of it in my early years, but. Less so now. Yeah. Um, well, then that leads really well into the next question, which is, you've written a lot of novels now, um, and so you've been part of the field. How do you think the field has changed? Like, we talked about your own work, but mm -hmm. if you, is there anything that you can kind of point to and say, yeah, this is how it's, it's changed since I kind of got in? I like to take some responsibility for the slew of tattoos <laughs> that have been unleashed <laughs> on the genre. Uh, I think, you know, the rise of the paranormals and paranormal romance has been a big change since my first book came out, and I think it would not be considered as groundbreaking or potentially controversial as it was at the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know, science fiction's been in a funk for quite a while. It has, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But fantasy's been strong. So, who do you read? Like, who, who, who must you buy, if anybody, uh, when it comes out? I feel bad in that I haven't been keeping up well enough to have, oh, I must have it. Yeah. Um, I'm an eclectic reader, so probably the last thing I was like, oh, I must have it, was Jonathan Franzen's Freedom. Yeah. Which I didn't like nearly as well as the corrections. <laughs> um, but... I don't know, I, I, I try and keep my hand in with fantasy and science fiction, um, but I enjoy mysteries, thrillers, keep an eye on what's going on in romance. There's a lot of good stuff in young adult. Yeah, there is. Right now. There is. Um, and that, it's kind of a part, one of the two-part question, which is, um, are there non-genre writers that you really like? Maybe even non-fiction writers that you, you know, you follow their work? Um... Sure. <laughs> I really hate favorite questions. Sorry. <laughs> you can even Is say category. I like, I like autobiographies. <laughs> well, I like anything if it's really well written. Okay, that's good. Basically. So, you know, there are some memoirs that are hysterical and wonderful. Yeah. Um, if I'm in the mood for something really fluffy, I'll read Janet Ivanovich. Yeah. Uh, I do read a lot of nonfiction. I'm trying to probably see this, it was the last thing that I really went, oh, that's well written. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mentioned memoirs. I, the last book I read was the memoir of Dick Van Dyke, because I was oh. a big Dick Van Dyke fan. Uh -huh. And um, it, it's, it was charming, but it was also kind of revelatory. His life is um, not exactly Robert Petrie. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so I'm with you. Um, I have to ask, because we have writers who like to watch some of these, um, and just one question, but what is the simplest thing you think aspiring writers overlook that could maybe most impact their future success? The simplest thing they overlook? Because I know that writers get into lists and these are the things I can do to you know, try and get published or try and, and get an audience. And I don't know this, but sometimes that my instinct is they overcomplicate it. And sometimes yeah. it could be as simple as when you show up at a convention, be cordial. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, there are some, you know, very simple truisms that we will all say because they are true. Write. You learn through writing. Yeah. And <clears throat> all the analysis and list making in the world is no substitute for doing it. And I guess don't be afraid to make mistakes would be one I think is really valuable. Yeah. You know what? Your first book, it might suck. Yeah. You know what you do? You write another one. That's right. Practice. I, I know a lot of writers who say, why would you think it's any different than learning to play piano or becoming a track athlete and star? Yeah, you know? that's, that's a very good observation. Um, I'm a musician, so I have to know a couple of music things. Um, there are writers who do and writers who don't listen to music when they write. Where, where, which camp are you in? <laughs> I don't. Okay. If it's on, I'll tune it out and I'll never put it on if it's not. Yeah, okay. So when you're not writing and you turn music on, do you have favorite artists or bands that uh, you like to listen to? Uh, I know you don't like favorite questions, but I know, I know. <laughs> indulge me on this one. <laughs> I do. I haven't kept up in the last few years with the contemporary music scene as much as I have been, but I have sort of perennial favorites. Um, and again, it's eclectic. And I tend to like somewhat eccentric artists. I love... Tom Waits, I love mm -hmm. Nick Cave, I love Kate Bush. Yeah. 
Um, oh, those are good ones. Yeah. I like all of those. <laughs> um, so, relatedly, uh, best concert you've ever been to? Or are you not a concert goer? Um, again, that's something I probably don't do as much as I wish I did. Yeah. But I do have a definitive answer to that. Oh, good. Um, and I'm blanking on the name of the band. That's okay, we can come back to it. <laughs> it was uh, Ways to be Wicked, Maria McKee's band. I don't remember that one. I'm totally blanking on it, but it was a small concert at the Marquee in London. And um, anyway, the energy was just tremendous. It was an intimate venue. I was living there as a super poor working person on a temporary permit and yeah. almost never went to anything with a cover charge, but went to this and it was awesome. And later I uh, read an interview with uh, the lead singer Mar Maria McKee went solo and Something her solo career, yeah, yeah, afterward. And I read an interview with her in Rolling Stone or something. That was the last concert they did together as a band. Oh, no. And she's well, like, you it were was, yeah, and she's like, it was really the most amazing thing ever. I'm like, it was! Yeah. I, you know, I like to go to live performance because I think there's a kind of energy there mm -hmm. that you don't... I, I, I love to listen to, but um, I'll even go to groups that are not my favorite, you know, mm -hmm. to see them live. Mm. Uh, but I'm, a, I'm kind of a diehard that way. Last question, which is, um, what can we look forward to in the future? Anything you can talk about? <laughs> uh, I have a sequel to Santa Olivia, which is another totally anomalous project I did, coming out in November. That's called Saints Astray. Okay. And then I'm at work on a new project, which is, again, completely unlike anything I've ever done. And this is it's technically an urban fantasy, although really it's a resort town fantasy. Um, any timing on either of those that you can share? Uh, I think late November for Saints Astray of this year, and probably maybe November of the following year for first book of untitled project. The next thing. Good. Well, we'll watch for that. Thank you so much for your time. I know what it's thank like you. to be moving around, doing signings, and these kinds of things. So uh, thank you very much. My pleasure.